folks, we're going to start up on our lesson on digital and analog transmission of information. And so you'll need to have two things with you. You're going to have your digital and analog transmission and storage of information notes page. You either pick that up right before spring break or it's in the link that's above this page. Uh, you'll also need a writing utensil. So um, overall, the, we sort of call this era that we live in, sort of the 21st century, sometimes called the information age, because uh, we have digital technology that we can send information anywhere in just very short amount of time. It's the whole reason why we're able to still have school uh, in the middle of this COVID-19 stuff is because of the fact that we don't have to be present. We can send information. Uh, I can send this video to you over the internet really, really easily um, in, in relatively short amounts of time. I mean, obviously, there are some technological limitations, but overall, this is not something that people were able to do 40 years ago, um, or certainly not 500 years ago. And so we sometimes call this digital technology, but you know, we use the word digital, we almost think just, okay, well, it's just modern, but that's not what the word digital actually means. So in a, we talk about what we mean by digital, uh, we want to contrast what digital is versus the old way of sending information, which is called analog. And that's what we're really going to be looking at in, uh, in this lesson and in the next lesson. Um, so for most of human history, we could send information. Uh, we either transmit it, that means to send it, or we could store information by trying to make an exact copy of the original thing in a new medium. So over here, uh, there's a, some fl a picture of some flowers. And so they are trying to make a new copy of that by tracing over the original picture. And this is what's called an analog transmission. It means making an exact copy of the original information, but in a new medium. Uh, originally, this picture was on one sheet of paper. The traced picture is now on a new sheet of paper. Um, and so that would be an example of an analog storage of information. Uh, another Another one would be if you were to take someone's words and you were to write them down on a sheet of paper is that we tried to make an exact copy of the original words but in a new medium. Originally they were in a voice, had sound waves, and then afterwards they're, uh, they're basically on, uh, on text that's written out. Um, so some examples of those. Uh, one would be painting a portrait. Uh, the original medium was the person's face. The new medium is the canvas. We've basically made a copy of the original onto a new medium, onto a new substance. Uh, so we're able to send the information somewhere else. Another one would be the printing press, one of the most important pieces of technology ever invented uh, that we could now make many copies of books relatively cheaply. The original medium was the metal type. This is how it worked for the printing press. You literally laid out little letters one by one on a metal plate and then you would put ink across the top, lay down a sheet of paper and when you do that it moves the information from the metal type onto the paper and you can do that relatively quickly and make lots of copies of, uh, of things very, very fast. And so that revolutionized the world when they came up with that uh, over five centuries ago. Here's a little more modern one, um, sound recordings. So this right here, we're going to be talking about records, you know, old vinyl discs. And so if you ever look at a vinyl disc, you'll see there are lots of little grooves. You can sort of see the little lines going through there. If you zoom in on those close enough, you'll actually see they look like this. This is under a microscope, what each of the grooves on a record looks like. And so what we've really done when you have a record is that you take those sound waves and then you make a copy of them in the engraving in the record. So right here, when you see this, this sort of groove sort of goes back and forth, that, that's the shape of the sound wave. And so we have literally made a copy of that sound wave in a new medium onto into the record itself, carved into the record itself. When we put the needle, uh, the records players have a little arm with a needle on the end, back in the groove, as that needle moves through the groove when the record turns, it makes the needle shake back and forth, which then reproduces the sound wave. And so we can then go from the groove as the original medium back to sound as the new medium whenever we play uh, a record like this. Uh, even more quote unquote modern than that in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, going up until the early 2000s, uh, we still had cassette and VCR tapes. Uh, probably you may have seen VCR tapes in your lifetime, maybe not a whole lot with cassettes, but on these is that the original medium was the sound for cassette tapes, video for VCR tapes, and then the new medium is magnetic fields on tape, this tape that's inside the VCR uh, uh, cassette, the tape that's inside the, the audio cassette, 
basically has little magnetic particles that can be uh, flipped around so they have their north or their south poles facing up uh, and then they basically encode they rec they make a copy of the original video image or the original sound image or sound uh, of information in the magnetic field so we made an exact copy of the original thing on a new medium and that's classic when we talk about analog it's always about to making a new copy uh, of the original information onto a new substance a new medium so those previous ones were examples of storage but we can also use it to transmit information to send it from one place to another so let's take an electric guitar electric guitars have metal strings whenever you play the guitar it creates vibrations in the strings we want to make a copy of those in the speakers and so there's little magnets little pickups underneath the strings and when this, the metal strings go over it changes the magnetic field uh, and as we know if you have a changing magnetic field it produces an electric current so the original sound wave that's in the guitar string then it gets changed into an electrical wave, a wave in the electric current. If you look at it, it's an exact copy. So we've made an exact copy that's in the electrical current that gets amplified, sent to a speaker. Speaker has a speaker amp, which then makes an exact copy of that electrical current uh, back into a sound wave. And that's basically how a speaker works. It takes an electrical current and then makes a copy of that into a sound wave uh, by once again uh, the electric current makes a change in the magnetic fields the uh, changing electric currents make magnetic fields or electric currents make magnetic fields and so uh, the changing magnetic field makes the speaker cone move up and down which creates the sound wave so we started off vibrations in the strings original medium we made an exact copy in a new medium electric current we then made an exact copy back into sound waves again just much louder so you can hear when the guitar is being played uh, our, our next example would be like uh, radio, like good old fashioned AM and FM radio. Uh, like, you know, if you get in your car and tune it to like 97.7 or 103.4, uh, basically we start off with sound waves. Someone is talking, let's say if you're doing talk radio, um, someone's talking into a microphone. The microphone then makes an exact copy of that original wave in the electric current. That electric current then goes to a radio transmission antenna, which makes an exact copy into the radio waves. So now that information is being, uh, that, that original sound wave has, has been copied into radio waves. When it gets to the antenna of the receiver, the one on your car, that then makes a copy back into electric current again, which then goes into the speakers in your cars, which then makes a copy back into sound. And so we've basically taken something like sound that can't go very far and made a copy into something like radio waves that can travel very far and then changed it back into sound so you can hear it again. And so that's a way we can transmit or send information from one place to another. And so these are all examples of analog waves of sending ways of sending information because we're really just taking information making a copy in a new medium and then uh, you know that's what we do so let's compare that with our second type of way of sending and storing information which is digital and so in digital transmission and storage we convert the information first into numbers and then we send or store it you can actually see it in the word digital there's the word digit that's inside it like a number a digit and so whereas analog tries to make an exact copy in the new medium digital tries to convert it or does convert the information into numbers first and then sends the numbers uh, which has some advantages and some disadvantages which we'll look at in the next lesson so here's an example of how we might digitize information we want to copy this red box so how do we turn a box into numbers well one way to do it is put it on like a sheet of graph paper and then we could say, okay, well, we have an x-axis, we have a y-axis, we could do like we do in math and say, this is one unit over and one unit up, so the, this corner is 1, 1, and this corner is 1, 6, and 8, 6, and 8, 1. And so by setting up those ordered pairs, we could say this box can just be written as 1, 1, 1, 6, 8, 6, 8, 1, 1, 1. Because if you just play connect the dots with those pieces, you'll end up with that box. And so that would be an example of a way that we could digitize that. Because I could send you these numbers, and then you could make an exact copy of this box as long as you have the same graph paper. Um, and so we have now digitized that information. But that's sort of simple. So. Uh, what about sound? Can we turn sound into numbers? Can we turn sound into numbers? 
So what we've got here is we've got my last words in a digital format. Uh, this is showing sort of the sound waves uh, that of what I spoke. Can we turn sound? And so we can then go in and take like a certain word. We can go down and say, let's look at the word sound. Sound. And we can zoom in on it. And if we zoom in on this, this sound close enough, uh, what you'll see is that we actually can manage to find the actual sound wave if we zoom in close enough. And there it is, uh, looking at the individual waves that are in here. And if we look really close at that, then we can see that these do actually produce, you know, there's sort of a wave that goes on here. We can sort of see the high spots and the low spots of that wave. But here's the thing. A wave can be graphed in the same way that anything else can be graphed, is that if I looked at this point on this sound wave, right here. It has a number on the y-axis, looks to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about like 0.48. Uh, that's its sort of amplitude at that point, not technically the amplitude, but how high it is above the axis or down here being about negative 0.33. Uh, and it's got a spot on the x-axis at time. So uh, 0.60514 or so seconds that are in there. And so every single point on the wave, we could write as a series of ordered coordinates, ordered positions, the same way that we did uh, for uh, the, the box whenever we graph those out. And so in the same way, we can sort of take those and we can manage to map out this sound wave exactly in the form of numbers. And by doing that, we have digitized that wave. If we wanted to go so far as to uh, turn images into numbers, not just something simple like a box, but an actual photograph, then we can do the same type thing. Uh, we can convert the image into a series of points, which are called pixels. And a pixel is basically the smallest part of a digital image, and we convert each pixel into numbers. So this photo right here of one of our classes last semester uh, is made up of many millions of individual pixels. And so we can see those pixels if we zoom in close enough. So let's zoom in. So here we have the same image that we can see on the screen, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit. So if we zoom in on this region, we'll see that it's not quite as clear as it was before. It's a little more, uh, a little not as high resolution, but if we keep zooming in, we eventually see that it starts looking a little blocky. Uh, and we can see these little tiny blocks of color uh, that are in this image. So each one of these blocks is a pixel. So that little block right there is a pixel and that little block right there is a pixel. And any digital photo you ever take is made up of uh, hundreds of thousands or millions or even tens of millions of these individual uh, pixels. Now, one thing you notice about a pixel is that everything in the pixel is exactly the same color. Now, in reality, this would be made up of lots of different shades of color, but whenever you take a digital digital image, it says, hey, I'm going to take everything in this region and just assign it the same color. Now, to be digital, though, it has to be able to take this pixel and convert it into numbers. And so here is how it does that. So if we were to pick like a pixel right here, I'm going to take a sample and see what color that is. So that pixel right there, if it'll let me uh, select it, give me a second to get that set up. Um, that pixel, I'll do a different one right there has this color right here. And so it's these colors shown here. And you'll notice that it breaks it up into three channels, R, G, and B for red, green, and blue. And since that pixel is blue, you can see it has a lot of blue and not nearly as much of red or green. But what it's done is because it's got more blue, it's going to give it a number that's higher on the blue scale. So 127 units of blue, 75 units of green, and only 52 units of red. And those three numbers tell you exactly which shade of blue that that pixel is. But if I go to the pixel that's maybe next door to it, uh, you'll notice the numbers change slightly. It's still got more blue, but that pixel was 61, 81, 131. If I go down here to this red section down here, that particular pixel is 210 units of red, 47 of green, and only 48 of, or 48 of blue. And so we can then take every single pixel in this image and just write it as a combination of those three numbers. And that way, when your computer gets that image or your phone gets that image later, it just gets the stream of numbers and it's able to reproduce that original picture by saying, oh, that pixel right there should have 210 red, 47 green, 48 blue and it can give it exactly the right shade. Uh, lighter colors like this are made up like white light. Remember, is a combination of all the colors. So you can see it's all the red, 255. That's the maximum amount of red of any color you can have. Uh, 243 of green and a little bit less of blue, which is why it's sort of a little yellowish 
right in here because it's got lots of red, lots of green, but not a whole lot of blue in it. And so we can take a picture and manage to convert it into a series of numbers by having each pixel correspond with a little bit of red, a little bit of green, and a little bit of blue.